Testing one, two, three. Testing four, five, six. This mic is too. Or for the radio guys in the crowd, syphilis. Syphilis. Okay, sorry. It's very expensive. Oh. Uh, hi, boys and girls. <clears throat> I am Skydog, and this is Security Freak. Um, all right. <laughs> Boy, that met with such, like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, fervor. Yeah. Um, Settle down. Settle yeah, there, down. sorry, we had to go all, all old school today, so. Um, we are, uh, um, let's see, we're going to talk about the dark arts of OSINT, open source intelligence. Uh, we're going to cover a few things today, hopefully uh, have some fun doing it and give you some interesting information. Um, what is OSINT, uh, the Acquisition Tools and Techniques, uh, techniques to an, uh, for anonymizing data, and also de-anonymizing data. Now, of this crew, I am the good-looking one, and this is the genius. So um, I'm going to do some uh, of the light and fun stuff, and then he's going to dazzle you with a lot of math. So For you. No, it's for dazzle. It's dazzle. Dude, that's a dazzle. 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 That's dazzle's one. <laughs> So um, what is open source intelligence? Open source intelligence is uh, information that you can find commonly available on the internet. Um, it is uh, things that you could find off of Google or data, uh, data repositories that uh, uh, you, you may have to actually have a login for, but it doesn't require you uh, uh, to be, you know, basically, you know, uh, have security clearance or something like that to get to it. It doesn't require a whole lot of uh, work to get to the information. Uh, Basically, why do you care? Well, uh, a lot of open source in, uh, intelligence can be used to find information about you. Uh, enough things can be put together to um, infer data about your activities, where you've lived, what you've done, places you've worked, um, and uh, how can it be opti or how it can be optimized. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, techniques for putting the information together and uh, cracking down on it. Uh, so a lot of it is publicly available data. Uh, it might be text uh, out of a uh, database somewhere that you can get access to. It could be imagery. Who's taking a picture of anybody at the con this weekend? No one's taking a picture of anyone at the con this weekend. Oh, one gentleman in the back, back there, the brave guy? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see for the lights. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, you take pictures and you put them online. If uh, you leave enough information in the background, I can typically figure out where you're at or some general clues about what you're up to. Uh, video is even better uh, because typically it's moving and I can get more information out of the background. Uh, audio, uh, we don't have as much. Uh, I mean, we used to do that whole time radio show. But um, uh, that, not as much anymore, but geospatial is the one that seems to be the real... Uh, Interesting one lately, uh, if you take a picture with your iPhone and uh, don't have the GPS turned off, <clears throat> it gives very uh, precise, precise information, longitude, latitude, altitude, the exact time it was taken, uh, the f-stop, everything else that's going on with it. So uh, a lot of that information can be put together to gather and uh, infer information about where you're at. The question behind it is the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, you can find a lot of information, but the trouble is actually sifting through what's there and figuring out what's true, uh, what's chuff, what's actually been messed up by whoever's putting the data in, or um, has anyone ever used like some of the search utilities, uh, Spokio, what is it, people.org, and it says, hey, here's so-and-so at blah, blah, land, drive. They don't give you the first part of that, or they may give you the first digit or two, but mang uh, mangle part of the uh, address information. If I put enough of that together, the signal to noise ratio goes high enough, I can figure out what's actually true and what's not a mailing address you had with your ex-girlfriend. Um, when I get enough information out of that, Robert, you have to quit laughing at me, that makes me feel funny. When you get enough information out of that that is clear enough, it becomes actionable data, which equals intelligence. It's actual information that can be used. Uh, you wouldn't want to do something, uh, uh, you wouldn't want to go off half-cocked to do something uh, based on just some random information you found out there. You'd actually want to make sure that you could correlate that against several different sources. So the history and origins, you had print media. Think Pony Express, not Federal Express. So back in the old days, um, you basically had uh, newsprint and things of that nature. 
uh, academic things that were uh, uh, stored away. Uh, then we started to move towards radio. There were people who actually paid attention and, and did transcriptions of what was on the radio. Uh, then we moved to television. Things were a lot uh, faster that way. Um, and then now we've made it to the internet age where you know everything about everybody uh, before you start dating them. And I told you you should take those pictures down. <laughs> Um, the evolution was from news sources. Um, then you moved on to uh, government repositories where they started to collect data and catalog things. I don't know if you've noticed lately, they've gotten really good at it. Uh, it moved through uh, academic publications. There are a lot of universities. In fact, I worked for one that cataloged a lot of information. Uh, and then it became, uh, uh, in this day and age, a lot of electronic databases that are easily sortable uh, and, and very easy to use. Uh, uh, current forms and uses, you have tools that you can use online. I'm going to pay for this later, I know. Uh, there, <laughs> yes, one more presentation that can't go in my portfolio. Thank you, Dr. Shippen. It's just a picture. I know, I'm yeah. kidding. Okay. So uh, you have websites that are out there that make for an easy interface to the information. Uh, and you also have databases that you can uh, become attached to or get copies of. Sometimes you have to provide some uh, credentials for that, but it can be done. Uh, anyone uh, use Maltigo? There we go. Uh, drill down on somebody based on IP, their domain name information. Uh, all of these things uh, give interesting uh, interfaces. It's very hard to visualize a lot of this data, so there are a lot of different uh, systems to put it, uh, put that into a viewable format. This is, that was a search on balls, right? Balls, yeah. yeah. 64, 120, anyway. Yeah. Um, anyone use FOCA? Do we know what that is? Couple guys, okay. Uh, so FOCA actually looks for metadata in PDFs and Word documents and things like that. So someone takes a, um, a PDF and puts it online uh, and makes it outward facing. So you actually go in and pull down their PDF. What they don't usually realize is there's actually metadata that talks about uh, whose machine it was, who was the original author. A lot of times it says location. So now I know the drill down location in the directory structure of where that information is. So by giving something away to the community, you've also given away pertinent information about your network, which I can go find you with. Uh, search Diggity is another one. Um, I think you've used that more than I have. Uh, recorded Future is one that we uh, had looked at before, but I think when we started messing with it, um, uh, it uh, wasn't exactly where it needed to be. Has anyone else used Recorded Future before? It's basically looking at things that have taken place in the past to uh, uh, to forecast things that will happen in the future. Interesting stuff. Then we had uh, Facebook coming out with graph search. There are other things that they've come out with lately that uh, help in finding people who have the same interest you have. It may be odd that I have the same interest you have just for a brief period of time. Uh, that actually will uh, work pretty well for me. Uh, some other things, social mention, uh, Spokio and Meltwater. I actually like people.org. I use a lot of that uh, uh, to crank through information. Uh, Johnny Long is, isn't here, but who has read Google Hacking or seen him do the talk on that for five, yard, uh, five years in a row? Um, <laughs> we love Johnny. I'm just playing with him. Uh, the Google Hacking database was actually a database built to store different query formats for Google. So um, you can go online if you're looking for a particular type of information or, you know, you have one listed here, in URL, slash root, Etsy password, in text. You know, I can actually... Um, run this through Google and look for people who have uh, publicly facing web servers or machines that are giving this information up. So instead of having to figure out the most optimum way of doing this, I just go on to the Google Hacking Database and try to look up a query that works for me, and it's a lot faster that way. You might as well share the work anyway. There's, there's actually one, can I mention one tool? Yeah. The, um, there's actually another tool that's not in here, which I think is interesting, people should know about. Uh, people familiar with the, like, words with friends, the Zynga application, yeah. And, well, they, uh, it's not the Zynga, but another company released a, um, what is it, Bang with Friends? Have you seen, yeah, now it, it's called, I think it's called Down. But you can find out people, like on Facebook friends, that are interested in maybe having some kinds of, uh, yeah, intimate relationships with, well, anyway, it just, I mean, I'm not, I'm not suggesting to do that, but that's an interesting kind of, information gathering tool if you it just to be used in that way only but you should not look for your neighbor yeah. but uh, that cute chick at the office um, so a lot of this data is like public data is cooperatively provided so um, 
it's, this is my name and this is what I like. This is information that you give up without really thinking that much about it. You're saying, you know, oh yeah, I like this page and it's, you know, uh, uh, ferret farming or something crazy like that. Well, okay, now that you've given that information up, it's not exactly um, world-changing information, but you've given up some information about your habits and you've done it rather willingly. You have uh, confidentially provided information. Uh, this is my session ID, and this is what I like, which is a lot easier to peg down to uh, or pin to you. Um, you have to uh, pay attention to questionnaires and surveys, surveys. You can actually be turning over information you don't really want to give to everybody uh, and pay attention to their privacy policies, uh, policies. It's entirely possible that they will say, oh, we won't sell this to anybody except all of our uh, affiliates. And at that point, what are you going to do? And then you have information that was unknowingly provided. The, wait, where did this come from? Which is usually generated government or academia. If you've participated in any kind of research, or uh, a lot of times there are studies based on children at birth. They de-anonymize the information, but there's actually a way to go back and uh, figure a lot of that stuff out. So um, the, um, I think you, you take off from here. The, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, theoretically, but yeah, I'm not going to yeah. let you have that. Do you get it back, man? So um, one of uh, uh, the I, – I actually have a tendency to be the guy who goes out to find people because someone will say, hey, can you figure out who this is? And I got pretty good at it over the years. I actually uh, – I'll hurt you. <laughs> um, one year, uh, like a month before DEF CON, uh, I happened to actually get a vacation. And I've had one of those earlier in life, and this one was pretty nice. Uh, I ended up being on the uh, uh, or poolside at the Bellagio in Vegas, which if you can make that one happen, have a cabana, worth the time. So I happened to be sitting next to a guy who was on my right, uh, who was in from out of town with a bunch of his buddies, and they're shooting the bull and talking about everything. Uh, they get up, or his buddies get up and leave, and it's, you know, Robin sitting to my left, I'm sitting there, I'm talking to this guy on my right, and I happen to pull out a MacBook Air, which I could not get onto the Bellagio network, not because I wasn't trying, their network sucks. Um, and in the course of, say, an hour, hour and a half, I talk to this guy, and we chat about, you know, China, we talk about politics, we talk about computer hacking, all kinds of crazy stuff. At the end of the conversation, his buddy comes back and they're going to go see uh, or go have dinner or something like that. And um, so the guy says, uh, says, you know, hey, really nice to meet you. Great conversation. Had a wonderful time. And I said, okay, your name is Brian and your, comp or your family owns a civil survey company in Seattle, Washington. And the guy says, uh, yeah. And I said, I'll send you an email to your corporate email address within 48 hours. And if you've ever seen someone turn white in front of you, it was hilarious. And the guy, I said, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything to you. I just want to show you, you know, the information you gave up, I'll show you what I can, what I can do. The next day, I take mm, 45 minutes laying across the bed in the hotel room with this laptop, and I dig down on this guy. I have video of him on YouTube. I have pictures of his house, everyone in his family, what he paid for his house, uh, everything about the company he has. Uh, I drilled down on the guy so much, I actually scanned his network at work and gave him information about, hey, you probably need to have your system administrator turn these ports off, and here's why. So he got an email about yay long to his BlackBerry while he's in Vegas from some guy he met poolside, and I had two pieces of information about him. Enough of an outlying information I could track him down, but that's that kind of fun stuff. Put your phone away. I'm sorry. It's your turn. And that's how we met. No, that wasn't me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is the part of the talk that gets really boring. Um, people are free to leave. I'm giving you a free out now. Okay, anyone? Okay, all right. Well, all right. I warned you. Uh, <clears throat> can that get refilled somehow? Yeah. Public data sets. So there's lots of data sets out there. Uh, if you go out searching, you'll find them. They're there, they're parsed, they're queried. Sometimes we just see the results of the data sets, but you can actually get the raw data sets and export them and do all kinds of cool stuff. Who's publishing these? Government, academia, big businesses, for all kinds of reasons. A lot of times for statistical and, you know, just for analysis, for, for good purposes, for things like uh, looking at outcomes and patterns and predicting stuff and it's all in the name of science and bettering society and um, yeah, better 
uh, helping your shopping experience, recommendations for you. What was that Amazon recommendation I got yesterday? Uh, remember, oh, so, okay, forget, well, okay. Sometimes they're off, like based on your purchasing history and I've had some interesting ones. Okay, so, um, but basically it's, it's for better decision making. That's the, the, at least the premise of why their data sets are published. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think that's true to some degree. Um, all right, a little bit about data science, which um, this is, you know, this is a field that's sort of largely emerged over the past 10 years and, and uh, um, I mean, it's always been around, but it's sort of been assigned this name of data science and of the, you know, sort of field of competitive analytics and, and you know, number crunching and, and statistical analyses for, um, you know, sort of in, in the corporate world especially for uh, trying to enhance um, the, uh, well, profit margins for purchasing behavior. But the, the main thing is there's, you know, statistics is basically you have a bunch of data and you're trying to create a model of it, whereas probability, you have a model and you're trying to predict the data. And that's um, kind of important. So uh, the, because both of those things kind of exist and you know, you, you take the historic data often to create the model, which helps predict future data. Um, or if we already have a model, we can go to predicting the future data. But that's, again, What's the, you know, trying to forecast the future, which way are stock prices going to go and what the weather's going to be and who's going to attack who, things like that. That's what, yeah, you're supposed to be doing with this data. Nothing bad or malicious, just benefit mankind. Um, data sources. There are so many awesome data sources out there that you can just, like, go to, download freely and play with. Uh, I love some of the names of them. Um, uh, I think my favorite is InfoChimps. Um, that's the name of the site. I don't know why, but um, uh, but the Open Government Initiative. Anyone ever? I mean, there's lots of data there. You can see, you know, like for socioeconomic information, and it's anyway. Um, but the, this is an example of just sites that provide giant databases that of information that you can download and play with. Let's just call it play with for now. Um, big data. So. Everyone's heard the word big data before, and is it, um, uh, is it a buzzword? I don't know, does anyone have any thoughts about big, I mean, it's, to me it's like, well, okay, it, data, and it's big, and there's more of it, but at what point is, like, when does data become big data? You know, it's like, okay, you know, greater than eight inches, it's big data. You know, it's when, what, I mean, no, serious, I mean, what is the criteria? Does anyone know the cutoff or something? You know, it's, um, and, I, and I, I sort of could not find any sort of definite criteria, but um, uh, apparently it, it's, I guess they just, you know, buzzword slash industry term used for data that's now being, it's being generated really, really quickly and it's very diverse and there's just, you know, large volumes of it, so that uh, the, uh, the, yeah, wonderful graphic there. Volume, velocity, and variety diversity is, is what, uh, which, again, that's really applies to all data, but it's, I guess, more so now, and uh, so therefore it's big. Um, and as a result, we now have all these cool big data tools. Big data tools, okay, just platforms, applications, things to analyze this data, to do number crunching, making it easier and easier for these data scientists or people in the commercial world to analyze all of this data and sort of do, you know, uh, create, you know, visually uh, appealing and, and sort of comprehensible maps and uh, charts and things that they can actually act make actionable decisions based on. And there's, it's, it's amazing, and this is, I mean, the more data, the more applications and tools and platforms being developed, and it's, it's a cycle that's feeding itself, and it, for us, we really thought it was cool, because we can now look at all this data and do cool stuff with it that maybe these tools weren't really initially designed for. Uh, terminology. Um, terminology, that's, that's like, means the definition of terms, sort of defining terms, termin okay. And, no, so the problem is that Depending on what you read, what study, what report, they, uh, yeah, anonymization, de-identification basically mean the same thing interchangeably 
and then de-anonymization or re-identification, also synonymous. But yeah, they are opposite things. Does that make sense, sort of? Kinda, okay, all right. So just keep that in mind. And I, I'm not really good at keeping like consistent with, okay, but yeah. Um, so anonymization, this is the process of taking this, these data sets and making them anonymous so that you know, we don't, our, you know, our personal information isn't stored out there for everyone to see, it's just, it's, we're just you know, some kind of uh, you know, nameless number or ID, and there's no way to truly identify who we are from just the data. So it's, you know, anonymize it. So you, so you have the PII, and it goes through some magical anonymization process, and then it becomes a public data set. Um, <clears throat> the actual anonymization process, there's a lot of different ones. You can, you know, certain variables can be removed, things that are like very uh, distinguishable or identifying, um, you know, global recoding, you know, re sort of um, uh, coming up with the method of, uh, of taking all the, the data and uh, coding it in un unidentifiable ways to the person across the whole data set, uh, local suppression of certain variables, um, um, even, you know, grouping or categorization, instead of saying, you know, age, they'll say, you know, you know it'll be an age range, and just there's, uh, you know, lots of different ways you can anonymize data, um, and some are useful for some, some, I don't know, it depends on, on the data and what it's being used for. The way to measure the, how sort of, how useful or how good the anonymization methods are is, is to use some kind of metric. And there's basically two metrics um, uh, to measure sort of the synonymization process. There's disclosure risk. So, okay, we've anonymized the data, and how well have we anonymized it? What is the likelihood of being able to sort of reverse engineer and reveal the original data from the public set? Um, so if it's you know, really good anonymization, there's no way you can reverse it back and find out who it is. That's, I mean, it's almost, you know, think of it almost as like, you know, strong crypto. However, by doing that, the problem is um, you want to, you, if it's, if that's done too well, then it reduces the statistical utility of it. So now, um, yeah, information retention. I mean, the information still needs to be there to be able to be used for analysis and studies. And so you have to sort of find a, a good balance between you know, minimizing the disclosure risk and, and maximizing information retention. And that's really, really tricky, believe it or not. And um, one of the problems that we face today with uh, data being released. Um, information entropy. Anyone familiar with this concept, kind of? Uh, it's kind of j just the, uh, forget about the equations. I'll, it's boring. Okay, but just the, the uh, more information <laughs> about a person, uh, yeah, the more, um, or the more information about a group of people or any, is the, um, you can easily, or I guess the easier it is to identify who that person is in that data set. Um, that's a relief. There's actually a great website, uh, 33bits.org or something, and it's it basically because that's the sort of total information entropy of the world, but okay, I'm, this is, I'm gonna try to skip the boring part and go to the audience participation. This is where we want your feedback. No, this is actually where we're gonna do a little experiment here to demonstrate the idea of um, sort of being able to identify people from what seems to be uh, harmless information, but actually can act, you know, pinpoint an actual person from, yeah, data that you don't think is really significant. And Sky is going to do it now. Go. Alrighty then. Who's come to Freak Dick for the, or excuse me, Sky Dog Gun for the first time? That's kind of funny. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Take two. Wah, wah, wah. Right. So, uh, who's been to uh, Sky Dog Con before? Okay. Everyone else? It's your first time here. You got to stand up. Sorry, it sucks. Got to do it. Okay. This is your first time to uh, Sky Dog Con, right? Pretty innocuous information. Uh, if you're female, have a seat. Not counting you out, ladies. We're just kind of taking smaller chunks of people out. Um, 
Let's if, see. If you're not sure of your gender, sit down. Yeah, that's not for <laughs> yeah. you. Oh, uh, see, we had a few people there. Yep. Okay, there you okay. go. That happens from time to time. It's sure. okay. It's yeah. okay. Um, so let's see. Um, two basic pieces of information. Let's go for a third. Uh, if you live within 15 miles of the hotel, stay standing. Everyone else sit down. Ooh. Wow. We just cut everybody down pretty quick there, didn't we? <laughs> Actually, would you have to calculate or something? You just don't want to commit yeah. to it. You don't want to be the last guy standing. Is that what it is? Hey, we didn't Within say sit 15 down. Miles. Wait, no, you got to stay up. Hey, so, no, no, I'm so saying. that was that was three bits of information, basically, and we cut it down to one person with three bits of information. So the site 33 bits is actually everything can be broken down uh, 33 bits or less. So three bits, we got one guy out of the crowd that met that criteria. With enough information, we find the outlier, and he's the one kick his ass. Yes. So. Um, Cool. Yeah. So uh, that's just sort of a, a you know a little demonstration we like to use to show that this is you know the the idea of what seems to be innocuous information taken as a whole and compiled together with not many more forms of innocuous information maybe two three four pieces and boom you can stand out from the crowd and be identified which a lot of people don't really think about but um, has been done quite a bit. Uh, um, think about how soon they Very wise man, wise quote. Um, so outliers, okay. So they're things that are, make people very unique and distinguishable. Um, just a single variable, okay, can be a really unique value, easy to identify, and um, yeah, boom, you're identified by that. It can be also be, you can, a multivariable outlier um, can be, a combination of maybe just two or three traits that also can really make you stand out from the crowd. I'm not talking about like this crowd. I'm talking about you know, in, you know, in millions of people that that um, it can create an, an outlying effect that, um, yeah, pulls you out of a crowd. It's it's harder to detect. Obviously, you're doing multivariable analysis, but it exists and it's um, something that can be can be detected mathematically and um, something to be concerned about. Uh, just in you know. Example of um, outliers, just, you know, you take, you know, IQ, bell curve, uh, average, and then you take mine, it's, you know, I stick out, I'm down there. And that's, so, uh, and I've been tested, and um, it's pretty significantly low, and that's that, um, so, and I'm not proud of it, but I'm working on, I'm going to take it again next year. Okay. Uh, data set intersections. This is kind of cool, I think. Yes. Yeah. Is. Ah, Okay. Data set, a set of data, right? Okay, so um, this circle represents a set of data. A, we're gonna call it A, okay. This next circle, another set of data. Guess what we're gonna call it? B, or to, ooh, I, I hadn't thought of that. Probably that would have been better, but I think I went with B. Okay, B, and now in the middle you have this intersecting area. This is what's called a Venn diagram. Wow, I know no one's ever heard that before. Okay, but no, imagine now another data set. So you have the intersection of A and B, you got C, and now you can look at all the different points of intersection. And the really mind-blowing thing is that in the middle where they all intersect is that A, B, C intersection. That's pretty, you know, could be a small population of people, maybe an individual person, but that's, um, and sort of visual representation of what can be done mathematically and presented visually. Um, unique variable overlap. Um, a lot of times when you plot out variable distributions, they can have bell curve type normal distribution frequencies. However, um, if it's an example of uh, being on the sort of tail ends of one and the tail end of another, even if different tail ends, the intersection can, is an example of multi-variable uh, outlying effect that can really be uh, insanely identifying as I've discovered. Um, so what I sort of looked at was the different kinds of mathematical attacks that can be performed on data sets to find individuals that are hidden amongst all these data. that. They're, it's anonymous data. It's all anonymized. There's no way. I mean, you could pick someone out of this because 
all the person I'd personally identifiable information has been removed. However, okay, things like record linkage and inferential analysis are uh, two forms of mathematical attacks that um, can be used. And, and you know, basically, record linkage um, is looking at the individual records in a database and linking information from them together can be revealing. Um, and same with inferential analysis is, um, well, it's, it's um, sort of uh, not so mathematically intensive, but um, actually we'll, I think we're gonna get to examples of each of them, I believe, so let's see. Uh, ah, target. Anyone remember the target pregnancy thing that happened? Uh, seriously? Yeah, the, Curtis does. Cur yeah? Okay, yeah, so, uh, but some people didn't. Like, so there was the targeted advertising, so based on purchasing behavior. Um, basically, this happened in Minnesota. There was a, a teenage woman who had been purchasing products, and based on her purchasing behavior, they did, a, they did a targeted advertising to her house, and I believe she was living at home with her parents, or at least with her father, and w was getting targeted advertising for things like baby formula and diapers and things like that, and it's like, oh my gosh, why is my daughter getting <laughs> advertisements for things for like a child? She's not pregnant. And actually got really pissed off and went to the store manager and complained. And anyway, as it turns out, she was pregnant and that's how he found out was through finding out from a Target store manager. And that's, um, Oops. yeah, it's uh, not how I want my parents to find out I'm pregnant. But that's, um, <laughs> but you have to be careful when you, I mean, this is, information is being collected and can be used all kinds of ways. And um, uh, oh, Netflix IMDb challenge. Um, remember, so when Netflix came up with their uh, sort of algorithmic challenge for a more effective algorithm for, um, you know, sort of recommendations. And so, that yeah, that was a big, uh, I tried, I attempted, I did not win that. Um, so another million dollars I will never see. But apparently some people who didn't win it, but did take the information from that, linked it to IMDB, and could actually actually figure out, identify who different people were that were act from the net anonymized Netflix data set um, based on their recommendations of the same movies at IMDB, and so it was sort of uh, linking one data set to another data set, and pulling out specific records that, hey, these match up and this is you. And so, um, yeah, anyway. Um, US census data. Uh, I don't know how the, the census data is collected anymore, but they actually used to like go door to door and, do they still do that? Knock on your, really? I hide. Is it really? Wow. Um, I know, I actually I have not, I don't answer my door, but I have not seen one of these guys. Okay, well, I remember as a kid, them come with the clipboard and everything, and um, uh, so, but yeah, I don't know how accurate it is, um, but so a, um, a researcher, this was actually quite a while ago, uh, I think Latana Sweeney, um, actually discovered that given just um, date of birth, one's gender, and zip code, 87% of the population was unique, could be identified just from those three aspects of data. Yeah, which um, uh, pretty amazing and somewhat scary. And if you look at it um, from actually the uh, information entropy aspect, you know, you zip code, there's about 43,000 of those in the US, um, and that's 15 bits and birth date. 365 uh, different days, birth year, uh, estimating say, you know, one to 70, but I guess obviously that's, uh, I don't know what the census is actually, how low or, but whatever, anyway. This is just a rough approximation and gender, one bit, just, you know, you can be a zero or a one or, or be transitioning between them if you're pre-op gender search. Okay, but, so you add that up, 30 bits, that's, you know, and that's, U.S. population is about 29 bits, and so that's, I mean, mathematically, you can see how, wow, yeah, that, those three pieces of information really would uniquely pick out someone. That's kind of scary, right? Because you wouldn't think, oh my gosh, I'd give you, yeah, that information, like, that's not, 
revealing or identifying, but it is. And I don't know. Uh, PGP, not the normal PGP, Personal Genome Project. This was um, a project where people could submit uh, information about their, um, so, you know, basically all their, their genetic history, they would um, submit it and it would be published, analyzed, and it, it was for people who actually wanted to learn about their own, like, specific medical problems or things about their heritage or past and, and uh, for, you know, it was for research purposes and they, but it was going to be publicly published but anonymized and um, uh, correlating genotype phenotype. And it, um, again, they were able to, or people were able to um, combine these two data sets to find, yeah, the gender date of birth zip code was contained inside of this information and boom, then, you know, you're identified and you didn't think you were going to be and this has medical information like and diagnostic information. You don't want people to know that, you know, you have herpes simplex 12, but now it's out there. And, um, okay, it's, it, I'm, work, I'm getting treated for it. I got meds, it's okay, it's getting better. Uh, so another case, um, uh, this, uh, this is just a graphic that really depicts what I've just been talking about and is here cool. for, to give me a break and actually it's for no purpose. I should just delete the slide. Yeah, but yeah, public database, okay, anyway. All right, the mathematical aspect of it, vectors. Um, people sort of know what vectors are kinda, okay, it's direction, magnitude, okay. But think of it as a set of data points. Think of it as a record in a database. And that would be like your X, Y, and Z in your three-dimensional, you know, and you three oh, yeah, three-dimensional space. Or, but it could be X, Y, it could be any number of attributes in any kind of, you know, n-dimensional Euclidean space, but go with three. Um, you got your vector, okay. And your vector magnitude, boom. Now, think of, this is just one record. Matrices, that's just a whole database full of records, okay. And now you can define uh, your matrix C, say A, is a whole bunch of vectors, and you can perform mathematical functions on these matrices. So one of the things is looking at, say, these two, two databases, database A and database B, but now they're in the form of matrices, and looking for a group of records, calling them R, such that it's the intersection between the two of them. How's that done? Using cosine similarity function. Um, so that's basically, you know, uh, typically is you see that with, with vector similarities, but it's the, um, you know, the degree of similarity between two vectors. W at what point do they overlap? What point do they, where is their commonality? And doing that with matrices can actually find, using these, easy to remember, and you can do this in your head. my wallet. Yeah, it's, but actually, uh, so with, with the matrices, which are actually now, we're really databases, and find the common records, the similarities, identify the people that are the same, and extract them, and boom, you've been recognized. Uh, Venn diagrams, another thing that we sort of uh, came worked on was, you know, everyone loves Venn diagrams, really easy to understand, and so, but we just sort of came up with the idea of sort of, uh, sort of layering them on top of each other. So sort of, uh, how are we doing on time, by the way? I'm sorry. Seriously? Yeah, never changed it. Yeah, you can talk about it off of 90 seconds. No, you're good, keep going. What's that 20 mean then? Wait. I have no idea, but it's okay. cute. Okay, so, okay. 20 minutes? But, yes. Oh, okay, just keep going, you're good. So, okay, all right. All right, so just on the picture here? Yeah, same one, okay. We got, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, data set A, data set B, and three overlapping variables. And when I say overlapping, I mean same, vari like the, you know, um, it could be gender, it could be height, it could, you know, just, but, because a lot of databases are going to have information that is not contained in another database. It's, so you're looking at just the, the records that have, or the, the functions that are similar, just what the traits are that are, that you could possibly match up. So, okay, let's say we have, 
two data sets and there's three variables that with possible overlapping values. Um, taking the Vens of the Vens. Uh, so we actually, well, let me just go back one quick second. So, all right, see the places right there where they kind of, you can't see what I'm pointing to on my computer, but yeah, so the intersecting areas, okay? Yes. Um, so just, just men mentally extract those, okay? Just the, okay, and now we take those together, okay? AV1, BV1 intersection, AV2, BV2 intersection, AVN, BV, and because this can be for any number of variables, but, and then where they all intersect is actually going to target um, some, somebody very specific or, and again, this can be applied at several different layers, several many times, but uh, we worked on this as a, um, a pretty cool and unique visual analysis tool for taking data sets and finding the common, uh, the common traits and then down to the actual person that, ooh, look, this person is the same person as this and this and ah, we've identified them and cool and now they're very unhappy but we haven't published anything or exploited it in any way for our own gain, yeah. Uh, so this is a concern um, because now OSINT can be used in, um, in ways that are quite powerful with mathematical attacks. These, it's, it's, there's a whole new set of, of tools that allow you to mathematically analyze large data sets for um, you know, exploiting sort of private information or anonymized information and make it now public information and really, I mean, you're extracting some really sensitive information that you probably, yeah, people don't want to be happening. Um, and this is happening, I mean, big data is making this more of a problem. Uh, all the tools for analysis and visualization, um, idiots like us coming up with ways to, hey, let's Venn the Venn and put layers and, yeah, um, coming up with tools like that just, you know, makes it even easier. Um, data sets are being published more and more every day all the time. They're getting bigger. We're giving out our information all the time, whether we realize it or not. In fact, we just created a data set by asking who here was from where and first time and don't forget to get their names. And yeah, okay, all right, we have a seating chart and we got, okay. So, but that, I mean, we think we're not giving away sensitive information and it, you know, as a whole, it becomes sensitive. So, um, yeah, and this is really, you know, essentially another weapon for social engineering. And that's, um, yeah. So what can we do to defend against the dark arts of OSINT? Um, oh, he's scary. Okay, proper sanitization methods. Uh, well, what does that mean? Well, sanit, <laughs> what? Front what? Back. What? Nothing, no, okay. no. keep going, keep going. No, keep, I, okay. I, I entertain myself with it, sorry. Okay. Are my pants falling down or something? No, okay, okay. No, no, my fly no, unzipped? No, okay. No. Okay, so, uh, proper. Yeah, sanitizing the data properly. Um, so, yeah, oh, whoops. Well, um, actually coming up with methods that really do uh, minimize the disclosure, but also maintain the utility of the data. What that, I mean, my solution for that, I have no idea. Uh, but it's something, someone needs to come up with something soon. Um, minimize disclosure, access controls. Okay, let's not make all these data sets available to everyone. You can't just go to a website and be like, ah, hey, I'll download this, do I want it, and, you know, it, it, what kind of, you know, what kind of format do I want to do, you know, for, is it uh, comma separated? I mean, it's just, it's amazing what is out there just for free, or maybe you just have to register and then boom, you get all this data. No, how about some access controls so that it's like, really you have to be sort of someone who legitimately is doing some kind of medical research or something for some purpose, but, that would be nice too. Um, but uh, for now, I'm thinking just falsify everything um, as much as possible, um, whenever you can, and uh, have some good aliases, make up stuff, fake IDs, whatever. Um, and yeah, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else? And that's um, yeah. Okay. It, well, what's yeah? Um, I think uh, OSINT continues to grow with data production. <laughs> Increased data creates more data sets of greater size. They can wow, read. Microsoft auto reader. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 So, um, yeah. Uh, uh, buy Noah a, a beer in the bar, and uh, he will explain it to you.
uh, in some really interesting terms. We've done some fun research and played around with some data uh, that we probably shouldn't actually have uh, said anything on record, but um, got any questions? If anyone has problems sleeping, I can talk to you for hours and put you to sleep. And, yeah. Um, uh, who's, where is that? Who's that? I, oh, geez. Oh, boy. Ah, well, uh, you're, you're, uh, I've never met that man before, but you, sir, I'm going to buy you a beer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Thank one mathematician Thank to you. another, but anyway. Um, Thank you. No, but any, um, any questions, criticisms? Anyone call BS? Um, back yeah. to back. How does using the cosine similarity function compare to doing statistical clustering, like either k-means or k-squared? Uh, yeah, so the Five bucks. I told you, there's one in every damn crowd. Come on. <laughs> Just kidding. No, here, here. seriously. What was No, 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 no. That's, yeah, that's, no. Uh, um, uh, no, that's a, a very good question. And so, um, uh, yeah. Um, it's depending on the type of, of data. It's so, the, and there wasn't time. There wasn't, you know, wasn't getting into the scope of it. But the um, depending on the, the the type of the data, there are actually uh, different types of statistical analyses that you know might be that can be more effective. Uh, you know, Jacobian index or you know just I mean the the clustering for uh, geospatial data. That's it's important. Um, uh, you know, there's uh, thermal information maps that can be, uh, you know, m much more um, uh, valuable for looking at patterns and trends and looking for overlap. So, no, that's, um, it's, what I'm saying is not like it's, I, I wasn't intending it to be like across the board. This is what's, it's just, it was a, an approach we took for certain types of data. But, no, that's, there are other methods, as you pointed out. Yes. Um, a gentleman years ago, uh, we had a guy that was in the, uh, the National 2600 group, and uh, he was very meticulous to fuzz all of his information. Everything he put out, he had deviations of his first and last name, uh, email addresses he put out, odd phone numbers and things like that. He happened to be in a meeting we had one time where the FBI was sitting on the other side of the room, and they came to talk to us about helping them do things. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, he was telling this story of how he had gone through and done all these things to anonymize his data, and the agents are poking each other and kind of giggling. And I was, this is kind of odd. And I walked over to him and I said, uh, so did you, like, is it, like, cause trouble? You change all that data? And the guy says, he's got a job. We can find him anytime we want. So the, uh, going through and, and trying to, to fuzz all that stuff, it's a lot to juggle a lot of those things. But some sites, like, I threw something up to buy two days ago. And it was very specific about the, uh, the zip code, even though it wasn't something, uh, uh, it was like the billing zip code or something like, you know. So it, de it really depends on uh, how diligent you are about doing that stuff. But a lot of times, you leave so much other data behind with other apps, it, it just, you can't get away from it too easily. But I know I think that's a, a great idea and should be done as much as possible. The problem I ran into is sometimes they actually check to make sure that the zip code actually matches like the town or state or something that, and if it does, so, and I started using like from the show, like Beverly Hills 90210, you know, like that was the only place I knew that, anyway. People, uh, Chicago, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there we see, okay, excellent. Everyone write that down, use that. And, I don't remember anyone asking you, Evan. I don't. Know. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, he's right. No, he's right. He's right. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Fist fight in the parking lot later. No, no. I mean, it all depends on the data sets and how many of them you show up across. Sure. Consistent with other people and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, be inconsistent in your falsification of information. Yeah. Yes. Everybody good? Anyone Any other questions? We're going to get off the stage and go have another drink. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.